So our, our, next, uh, our next speaker will be ZJ Tang. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biological Engineering, uh, where he works as a research assistant in both the synthetic biology group and in the research lab for electronics and in the uh, mediated matter research group at the MIT Media Lab. He's going to tell us about uh, engineering living functional materials for environmental applications. So I'm um, very honored to be here. So I am currently working with Professor Timothy Liu and Professor Nary Oxman. So today I'm going to talk about how we, like, so we have some stories about how we deliver living materials for environmental sensing applications. So what are living materials? So basically we are trying to incorporate living cells in those new materials so they can sense and respond to environmental stimuli in a design pattern. So as you know, like in the past two decades, there are like tremendous advances in synthetic biology where we can actually use the design principles from other engineering fields such as computer engineering to uh, engineer cells as machines so they can actually do a lot of different works in a very designed pattern. So you can actually let the cells to do calculations like adding stuff, subtracting stuff, multiplying. You can do logic gates, you can do state machines. So they can actually store the memory, like store the information in their DNA and you can read out later. So this is a very nice example of how whole cell biosensors can be used in different applications. And we also need helps from material design such as like hydrogels which is a very good biocompatible material which can allow the diffusion of input and output, small molecules as well as nutrients in and out our devices. And we, we also use some help from 3D printing. This kind of techniques can let us specially arrange the cell in a certain pattern so we can actually skip the time-consuming morphogenesis we see in biology, and we can actually put the cells in a certain way, they can actually function as a organ-like uh, behavior. So we are trying to operate at the interface of these different technologies. So the first example I would like to show is uh, how we develop composite living materials, because we started with different kind of microbes. They are like really tiny. They cannot really build a lot of bulk materials. So we, with the, uh, we use the help of the hydrogel developed by our collaborator, Shanky Giles Group in Mackey. So these can actually act as a very tough uh, matrix to hold the device to maintain the structural integrity while the cells do the sensing part. So the first example, we have a stretchable wearable device where you can create channels and uh, chambers inside a top hydrogel. You just put uh, engineered bacteria in there. So when they are in contact with certain chemicals, they can create different fluorescent output. So on the top, you can say you can, uh, we can do it in the form of a skin patch, or we can also put them on the tip of gloves so they can actually tell you if there are like certain chemicals presented in the environment. And the second example, we can also print those cells in a living ink. So um, our collaborators, they have come up with this way of like use the engineer cells we provided and they can print it on top of your skin so you can have a living tattoo kind of thing. So they can tell you whether these three chemicals are there on your skin. And the last example here is actually when we are thinking about there are a lot of wholesale biosensors, but you cannot just like grow a bacterial culture and just like go to the river and just throw it in there, expect something would happen. So we, you actually need a way to like contain the cells of those like genetically modified organisms and you want to retrieve them very easily. So what we have came up uh, is a strategy where you use this tough hydrogel based capsule where you can have a shell, which is pretty tough. They can provide a mechanical protection as well as a physical containment so the bacteria cannot get out. And you have a core which is made of alginate that can like provide nutrients to sustain the growth of the microbes. And also like the engineer genetic circuits where we can design the cell to function in certain ways. So these are the goals we want to achieve. So first, a physical containment. The second one is a control lifespan because we don't really want the microbes to still stay alive after their jobs are done because this is, will only increase the risk of uh, potential DNA escape into the wild. We don't want that. And we, the last one is also, uh, of course, the sense and respond part of the living devices. 
This is what they look like on a Petri dish. So it's actually, you can make them in different sizes. This one is about five millimeter. And on the right, you can see when you like peel it, like the peel the uh, top hydrogel off, you can actually take the core out and try to retrieve the cells. And you can store the, these beads in PBS or in water or in LB, put them in the fridge, and we see like they are still active ap after two weeks. Uh, this is like showing they are uh, they can withstand up to 70 to 85% compression without breaking. And if you put them in the rich medium like LB and you incubate them overnight shaking at very high speed, there is no growth in the surrounding medium. It shows like all the microbes are like contained. Uh, whereas if you don't have the shell, just the core, you will have a lot of bacteria growing in the surrounding medium. And this shows how much cells, how many cells we can retrieve from the core. It's nearly 50% to 100%. So you can actually use these cells for further analysis, like single cell flow cytometry or even like plating, like the simple techniques. And this shows like the protection of the shell is not just mechanical. They can also provide like chem chemical protection uh, against certain uh, environmental insults. So in this case, canamycin, which is an antibiotic, and pH4, which is a relatively low pH for E. coli, when they are in the bees, they are much more resistant to them. And also, since there is a physical barrier, so the microbes cannot really interact with what's out there in the surrounding. So you can actually block all potential horizontal gene transfer between wild-type bacteria and our en engineer strain. As a simple example, we can show like the microbes when they sense this small molecule ATC and they just turn fluorescently green in the gel. So what do we want to do is we have developed a lot of different kind of like synthetic biology tools in our lab, such as some recording device because sometimes in the long-term monitoring processes, you don't want the uh, output to be absent when the input is gone. So for example, you want the bacteria to remember when, like what's the length and magnitude of the input, and you want them to be able to write that into their DNA and you read out afterwards. So this is a, uh, a more complicated circuit we have in the lab where we can detect two chemicals as well as their like uh, induction time, like the length and magnitude. And we can read it out by, this output is just simple plating, because those cells who are turned on would be resistant to canamycin. And we can also make communication modules. So you can actually do division of labor between different kinds of beads. So in the first type of bead, you can have a cell that sends the small molecule and produce a communication molecule, which is AHL. And this molecule can diffuse to other receiver beads, and they can generate a final output, in this case, green fluorescence. So this is what they look like. And now we're talking about how you control the lifespan. So basically we work together with another lab in Yale University. They have this strain that only survive when you give them artificial amino acids. So above a third, uh, certain threshold they can grow, but below that they cannot survive. So using this strategy, you can tune the concentration of this chemical and you can control like how long they live. In this case, after 48 hours, they are almost uh, not viable in the device. As an example of like real world application, we build a string that's able to detect different kinds of metal ions. So in this case, they can divide, uh, detect zinc, lead, and cadmium at different concentrations. So we actually went to Charles River and we get the river water we bring them back to the lab, and we have the bacteria in, uh, put them in this tea bag, and we add the contaminant, in this case, different concentration of cadmiums externally. Because apparently the Charles River water is very clean right now, you, can act, you cannot really actually detect this uh, contaminant we're aiming for, so we added them externally. So this is what we have. So you can see like there is a sharp peak, shows activation, and it's actually pretty sensitive. So it's actually, the threshold is below the state regulation for cadmium toxicity. So just to recap, this is what we have. A strategy which combines the physical containment, which is top hydrogel, and we have a chemical containment uh, we put in a core to, in this case, like providing an artificial amino acids for the growth of the bacteria. So it's like a double protection because we really 
uh, want the bacteria to stay inside the bead without escaping. And also, the circuits, which allows for all sorts of the synthetic biology tools developed uh, in labs. So moving forward, what we really want to do is like we want more than just a composite living material because it would be really nice if you can have an autonomous system where the bacteria or microbes can actually grow the matrix they live in. So they can have a, like a standalone device kind of thing. So this work is in collaboration with Charlie Gilbert, who is a grad student in Tom Ellis group at Imperial College. We actually get inspiration from kombucha. So some people might know kombucha is like a hipster drink. It's a fermented tea. They sell it at four to five dollars in Whole Foods. And we're not actually interested in the liquid part because uh, it's, we haven't found any application for that yet. It's very healthy, I know. But what we are focusing on is the top layer, which is considered junk in, like, in terms of food. But it's actually really tough material, which is made of cellulose by the bacteria. So what's inside kombucha is you have a, a symbiotic community of uh, Acetobacter, which is a family of bacteria, as well as yeast. So the sugar will get converted into ethanol by the yeast, and the ethanol can be used by, uh, by the bacteria to produce cellulose. What we want to do is we let the bacteria to produce the cellulose, and then we want the yeast to do material functionalization as well as environmental sensing. So what's good about this system is it's very easy to grow. So basically, you just take some liquid or even the pellicle on the top, transfer it from the old culture to a new batch fresh medium, and just let it stay there. So it's a static culture at room temperature. So you can be like a fermented tea, for example. You just put sugar in it. And after two or three days, you will have a new culture with this membrane. And this membrane depends on like what kind of yeast strain you put in it. It can be like a sensor, or it can be like a smart filter where they can actually sense and also remove the contaminant from the environment. So in this case, we just want to show like you can do some very simple trick. In this case, the yeast per, uh, produce a small protein that is an enzyme that binds to this uh, cellulose matrix and then can convert this yellow substrate into red. And it's pretty effective. So this whole process only takes about 10 minutes. So what's interesting is like, this is when the uh, pellicle is floating, is hydrated. But once you dry it, you can actually store it for much longer time. And when you want to use it, you can just rehydrate it. And you can still have this uh, very quick conversion within 10 minutes. This is how they look like. So we also uh, play with the physical property of the medium. So you can have different degree of incorporation of the yeast into the membrane. This is the wild type one. So you can see most of the cells are on the top of the membrane. This is what's inside the membrane. It's very like packed layer structure. So once we tune the density, you can actually incorporate more yeast cells into the matrix. So you can actually have a thousand times more cells, so a thousand times more response. And then you can have a more porous structure inside the matrix. Maybe it's, this is useful for certain applications. So uh, what we have been doing is like we want to choose some environmental issue relevant chemicals. In this case, it's a human hormone. So this kind of chemicals are also considered as like a major contaminant in some areas. So in this case, we add estrogen. It's actually human estrogen. So when you Add it to the wild type, which is not modified. You don't really see any fluorescence. But when you put it in the engineering strain, you show very strong green fluorescence. And we actually dry it and put it back after four months. And the response is still very visually recognizable. So what we've been working on is we want better sensors. So now we can do sensing. We are working with other labs at MIT. So they can actually uh, per produce proteins that can drag down the metals or like pr produce toxins to kill pathogens. And we also are doing other like tuning the physical properties as well communication between the bacteria and the yeast. So what I've been talking about today, the first part is how we build composite living materials where you use E. coli plus hydrogel to make responsive materials. So uh, they can be in a form of wearables, 3D printed, and deployable tiny capsules. 
And the second part, moving towards like building a whole autonomous living material, we draw uh, inspir uh, inspiration from kombucha, where we can grow and functionalize the cold culture and make them sense environment input and change material properties. So with that, I would like to say thank my colleagues and lab mates, as well as Silent and JWebs for supporting my research. Thank you. Thank you.